Hi, I have a very special guest today. If you are young enough that you were totally aware of the stuff that was going on in 2008, then you probably remember the publication of a book called My Stroke of Insight by a woman named Jill Bolt Taylor. This book really changed a conversation that we were all having about the brain and about spirituality, what scientists were beginning to understand. Because Jill Bolt Taylor is herself a Harvard-trained and published neuroscientist. In 1996, she experiences severe hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of her brain, causing her to lose the ability to walk, to talk, to read, write, or recall any of her life. Her memoir, which was that book, My Stroke of Insight, documented her experience with that stroke and an eight-year recovery period. The book spent 63 weeks on the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list, and now she has a new book, and this one is called The Whole Brain, The Anatomy of Choice and the Four Characters That Drive Our Life. It's just as good as the first one, and I'm so honored to have her here. Jill, thank you so much for being here. Marianne, it's so good to be with you again. It's so good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, tell me, how do you feel that my stroke of insight both changed the culture and also led to the second book? Well, I, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's been now 13 years since my stroke of insight came out. And I really didn't know immediately how, what the impact would be. And because of the TED talk that I gave, also called My Stroke of Insight, it just got catapulted out into the world. And that really gave it an opportunity to make a big impact in a lot of different ways. And it's really only been in the last few years that it has has penetrated my consciousness about the power of that book in helping bridge our science with our spirituality. So, uh, you know, of course, I'm thrilled that the book was so well received. And then over the last decade, it's been, okay, that was kind of a what happened, but that wasn't all the lessons learned. And the new book, Whole Brain Living, is the lessons learned from that whole experience with stroke through the eyes of a scientist. And so I truly feel that this particular book is, is the purpose of my life. So for anybody that just by any chance has not read The Stroke of Insight and has not followed that story, give me a little encapsulation of what happened there. You yourself, a brain scientist, have a stroke, are able to observe your experience from the perspective of a uh, of a scientist. What do you think was the uh, was that core core idea that so exploded in the minds of the mainstream uh, mainstream consciousness that made people go, "Wow, what was it that we got from my stroke of insight?" The stroke experience happened. It was a major hemorrhage in the left half of my brain. And my research at Harvard had been specifically about how does our brain create our perception of reality? Because I have a brother who's been diagnosed with a brain disorder, schizophrenia. So I was trying to understand, well, what is reality? And how does this brain create that understanding as what is the societal norm that we all agree upon? And how does that happen in our brain? And then the hemorrhage happened in that left hemisphere, and I lost all of mm. my ability to walk, talk, read, write, communicate, or any, any memory of my life. So I lost my experience, my ability to have a relationship with the external world. And in the absence of that left hemisphere, I shifted to in an untethered, if you will, consciousness of my right hemisphere, which is the experience and the thinking ability capacity of our beautiful uh, human brain, but completely in the present moment without me, the ego, without me, the individual. And so that experience of peace and eu euphoria and 
And it was just this incredible sense of blissfulness. And I think that, that we live with so much pain in our lives, our pain from our past, our fear of the future, climbing the ladder of societal norm. That's such a hardship, a hard challenge that we're born into as human beings. And in the absence of that, I, I still was alive. I, but I, I didn't have that. Instead, I gained this real connection to the consciousness that is beyond simply my relationship with the external world. And that is what has captivated so many millions of people. How do I find that? How do I find that peace? And, um, uh, yeah, I think that that was, that's it. I, I want that. Whatever that is, I want that without having <clears throat> a stroke. Do you think that that's where people go in near-death experiences? Um, you know, near-death experience is a tough question for me because um, when the brain shuts down and is uh, threatened by death, if you will, um, other people have the light or they have other loved ones or they have these experiences that I did not have. Um, for me, I had a, a different kind of knowing, a different level of still being connected. I just didn't have those cells capable of connecting to the external world. So I, I don't even describe my experience with stroke, even though I was all but dead uh, as a near-death experience, mm -hmm. because I don't fit into the formula that other people tend to fall into for that. I didn't disconnect. I just went as far beyond this realm of knowing and understanding as I could possibly get without being dead. Do you think that perhaps that is the experience that people have at death? I think that at death, when we look at the cellular structure of the brain, we have these four different modules of cells in the right brain, the, the emotion of the present moment, the experience of the present moment, the thinking capacity of connecting to some consciousness that is uh, not merely within us, but around us and in every cell of our body is what is is one capacity and, and uh, that's what I gained but I as I disconnected from the left brain that connected my thinking rational brain and my emotions of my past and my future so to me we have these different modules of consciousness piled up on top of one another and as I lost the details of the external world and shifted into the present moment, then the experience of the present moment kind of faded as well because I had no, no impetus, no energy for action. Then I shifted into that consciousness that exists, whether I have this physical form or not. So if that's your question, then mm -hmm. the answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, one of the things that's happened also more recently and since the publication of My Stroke of Insight is a whole new generation discovering and some rediscovering psychedelics, which I think brings up a lot of that as well. So let's go into the new book, which you said earlier you felt that My Stroke of Insight described an experience and this new one, The Awake, the Whole Brain, talks about what you feel are the ultimate lessons. So tell me about that. Talk to me about the four characters on the left and the right the thinking and the feeling. Um, lay that out for us. So uh, the difference between a mammal and a reptile is the addition of new tissue on top of the nervous system. So adding a new level of complexity, and that is the emotional system, the limbic, the cells of the limbic system. And so we have these two modules of cells because everything in the, the brain is bilateral by two, on one on each side. And so we have emotional cells with uh, two amygdala, two hip hippocampi to anterior cingulate gyri, these groups of cells of emotion. And then the difference between a typical <coughs> mammal and a human mammal is the addition of thinking tissue on top of the emotion. 
And so what we're doing as human beings is we're essentially working the kinks out between the newly added on thinking tissue, which is in the left brain, our thinking, rational mind in relationship to the external world. And in the hu- in the right hemisphere, it's the thinking connection to that which all that is in the present moment. So we end up with these four very specific modules of cells, two emotional modules of cells and and two thinking modules of cells. Now, each of these modules of cells are very integrated in firing as a mass. They're intraconnected, and they end up with very specific skill sets, which ultimately feel or experience, we have the experience of them as a character. It's part of our character. And so we end up with character one I call left thinking. The, the left emotion will be character two. The right emotion will be character three. And the right thinking will be character four. And it just so happens that each of these four characters uh, overlap the four archetypes of Jungian psychology. Well, why would that be? That's because at a biological level, it is inside of each one of us. However, instead of perceiving each of ourselves as a single archetype, we're actually one which is totally conscious that character one, rational brain. And in Jungian thinking, characters two, three, and four are all a part of our unconscious or subconscious mind. But in whole brain living, they're not unconscious at all. They are, are, they are characteristic profiles of ourselves that we can get to know well, embody at any time, recognize in ourselves, recognize in each other, and then have the power to choose moment by moment which of these four characters we want to exhibit in any moment. And to me, that's total human power. How do we achieve that integration? Well, I think that first by knowing who are these four characters. So character one, left thinking, this is our rational brain. This is the part of us that organizes and categorizes. It likes to control our relationship with the external world. Mm -hmm. It defines the societal norm of what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. And it likes to be in control of everything. So this is the part of us, our Mm A-type personality that goes to work. We all know that character. I just encourage people to get to know that character very well. Give it a name so that you can call on that part of yourself at any moment in time and recognize when you're being that character one or when the people around you are being in their character one. Character two is all of our emotional pain from the past. So it's about me, the individual, the left brain, me, the individual, my emotion about me from my past and my fear of the future. So we know this part of ourselves. This part of ourselves uh, is also our addiction tissue. It's the the group of cells that has a craving. So that drives us into our addictive activities. So we all know our pain. We we know when we are in emotional pain. Uh, we buy it's also our fight or flight. Um, and so it gets loud or it's gonna run or it's gonna hide, whatever it's going to do. But we know this part of ourselves. Character three and four are in the right here, right now, and it's not about me. The individual. So it's not about Jill Bolte Taylor. What it is, is it's about the experience of the present moment. So character three is the experience. What does that, how much humidity is there in the air? What does that feel like in my, on my skin? What does it feel like to have these glasses on my face? What does it feel like when I dive into the water and I feel the temperature of the water and the pressure against my, my body? It's an adrenaline junkie and it's it's a part of us humanity. So I want to go explore and be adventurous and be creative and be innovative. And I want to bring you with me because we are humanity. We, you're a part of me and I'm a part of you. And it's more fun when it's all shared together. So character three and then character four is the part of ourselves that exists at one with all that is. It's not busy. It's not go, 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 do, do, do. It's not hooked on all the external world. It sits in a complete sense of grace and gratitude. Oh my gosh, 
I'm alive. I, I simply, I'm alive. This mass of cells is the difference between me not being alive and me having life. And some of these 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses have eyes that see and has a voice that can speak and a brain that organizes and muscles that move me. And oh my gosh, I'm alive. And it's in that sense of gratitude that I exist at one in that sense of love, of divine grace. So there is a way to live with all those four characters in harmony, in integration, and that basically creates a personality structure and a life that works, correct? Exactly. So, so what kind of an effect has modern life had on our capacity to reach that integration? How have we done in modern society? You talk about the effects of technology, uh, the radical materialism of the, of the last, uh, last century, really, the mechanistic viewpoints that have dominated so much of our culture. Uh, what has this done to us? It has skewed our attention and our focus on the external world. And in doing so, it has also brought in the value of me, the individual, as opposed to I am a part of a collective whole. I become me, me, me. And the whole world focuses around me. And then in my relationship with the external world, I measure my sense of value of me, the individual, based on how my materialism measures up to everyone else's level of materialism. So in that skewed percep perception of myself and the value of me and my left brain, we have skewed our sense of value and what's really important. But meaning and purpose are not registered at the level of the me. Meaning and purpose is actually in how do I be of service in relationship with others to us, humanity, as the collective whole, as we relate to this magnificent planet, which we have to lim live with symbiotically. So it has skewed our value from truly being balanced in relationship with the whole, with me as an individual, in service to the collective whole. Instead, it's all about me, the individual, and my measurement of materialism. You can also see, though, the way that this was an overcompensation on the earth for a time in which the individual had no value at all. The celebration, the high side of Western individualism, the high side of valuing the individual at all. You can just see that we took it too far. We went from rugged individualism to rugged narcissism, and we have to just bring it back to the center, right? Because yeah. isn't the real integrated life both and a little bit, a yin and a yang of appreciating our individual freedom and our collective responsibilities and how the two are intertwined. That is exactly whole brain living. So that has, what you are describing is whole brain living. So that, so this is so interesting because that means it has profound societal and political implications, not just personal implications, which is why so much of this brain research now seems so significant to me because it, it, it points us to necessary evolutionary movement, not only in how we see ourselves, but how we see a nation. Uh, and how we see a species existing on this planet. Exactly. Well, as you, as you look at where we are now, would you go so far as to say that our lack of integration is actually maladaptive for our survival as a species? I think that's obvious. <laughs> I, I think we're in very big trouble. And, and for me to, uh, you know, the, the value of whole brain living is understanding that we're not using our whole brains. We have skewed way to the left while some of us have skewed way to the right. And I'm not talking political left and right. I'm speaking cellular neuroanatomical yeah, right, uh, hemispheric of the brain. Uh, shift. Yes. But what's the byproduct of that going to be is going to be 
a natural value structure underlying a political reality and activation based on those values of each of those two hemispheres. So not meaning to go into the world of politics, we end up there because the politics is the external expression of what do we value. And so the ultimate goal is to find a relationship and a balance between what's going on in each of these hemispheres, recognizing yes, I am an individual, yet I am also a part of a collective whole. And the collective whole of humanity at this point is being very destructive, not just to humanity, but our relationship with this planet. Well, the word politics comes from uh, the root politeia of the people. And if the entire shift that you're talking about has to do with an o going from an overfocus on me to a deeper appreciation of we, you can't avoid politics because all the exactly. politics is, is our collective behavior. Yes. That's where we're mainly sick at this time. Individuals are, you know, there's a lot of evolution going on, but if we continue to live under these regressive systems, economically, politically, and socially, then we'll all be a bunch of enlightened people watching the nuclear bomb go off. Exactly. I mean, we have to address the political and sort of re reimagine and recreate our entire sense of politics so that it does have this more sophisticated uh, reference point of whole brain living and the evolution of the species as opposed to just the same old, same old political games that nobody with any higher consciousness wants to be part of. Exactly. Once again, how do we do it? So I see the, I see cells are living creatures and the cells are in relationship with cells as, and they create societal norms inside of the brain. So they become a microcosm in relationship to the macrocosm of us as people on the planet. So cellular behavior becomes very predictable based on what we can predict in human behavior and vice versa. And in order to have a truly healthy brain, mental health, the output of the brain is a byproduct of brain health. So for me, the question is, how do we create a healthy brain? And a healthy brain is going to be brain that is made up of healthy cells. Well, what is a healthy cell? A healthy brain cell is a cell that is individually getting, uh, getting the nutrients that it needs to <clears throat> thrive and having its waste cleared away so that it can then create healthy interconnections with other cells. Well, isn't that a description of a healthy society? Healthy individuals with healthy brains having having health within themselves so that they can then create healthy networks with other people. But ultimately, a brain is a single entity, and it recognizes that the lack of health of a certain part of the brain skews the health of that brain into lack of health. And that is exactly what at the macrocosmic level has happened with the human. So how do we create a healthy brain inside of each one of us? And for me, that is whole brain living. How do we look at these four different parts of our brain and have them in intercommunication with one another so that each part of my own brain has value? I recognize its value, and yet it's brought into check by <coughs> the other characters inside so that I'm looking not just at my behavior as the action of me, the individual, but me in relationship as an individual to the collective whole of all of my brain. And so there's a um, uh, what I call the brain huddle. And the brain huddle is a conversation that we can hold inside of our brain between each of these four parts of our brain so that essentially the brain becomes, my brain becomes a democracy. And I don't make a decision or have an action in the external world without bringing all four of my characters into that conversation. And as soon as that character four that is connected to that which is uh, um, a, a cosmic consciousness or a bigger infinite consciousness, call that God, call that Allah, call that whatever you're comfortable calling that, 
when that, as soon as that piece of me is engaged in that conversation, then I'm going to make decisions based more on the health and being of the collective whole of humanity as opposed to just me, the individual. So you can certainly understand that if somebody wakes up in the morning and the first thing they do is read the newspaper, first thing they do is download social media, it could be very, very difficult for that brain huddle uh, to occur. So three things come up for me uh, that would be conducive to the kind of brain health. One has to do with the life you're living right now that you described to me earlier, deep in nature. Uh, I think our brains seem to me to be wired for sustenance and nurturance, right? When we are in the presence of nature, is that correct? Absolutely. It, it is the our second character that form. comes up from, right. So the second one that comes up for me would be prayer and meditation. Those are harmonizing agents. Is that correct? Those are tools that we can now, use to that silence me, our left brain so we can access that right brain consciousness. Yes. Create the brain huddle. The, the next one that comes up for me that, that I think is very important for our society is food, healthy food. You know, people use terms like brain food. Um, when you look at the diet of some people uh, in this society today, refined sugars, et cetera, doesn't a lot of the unhealthy eating that people do actually contribute to this disintegration of the uh, brain cells and the characters in the brain? Absolutely. And I'm going to include in the subject of food as how do we supply nutrition to our body? Sleep. Because we we live in a, at least sleep. in Western world, mm -hmm. uh, we're sleep deprived. And sleep, mm -hmm. uh, sleep is mm -hmm. the reset button for everything inside of our body on a daily basis. And if we don't allow that, that reset mm -hmm. button to hit, then we carry some lack of wellness into more lack of wellness into more lack of wellness. And there's pretty much a direct linear correlation now between lack of sleep and the presence of dementia, because we have to have, as well as cardiovascular health, movement, uh, f f our food intake and our sleep cons uh, intake. This is how, these are the three fundamentals of what do I need? Well, how do I need to pay attention to myself in order to become a healthy person? I see that in my own life. And you add to that enough meditation time, particularly in the morning. What are your thoughts about the effects of technology on all of this? Well, technology speeds everything up. One of the things about a computer is you turn it on and it runs and runs and runs and runs and runs until it blows up and then we replace it. And so this is a tool that we humans have been interacting with for now close to uh, various forms of technology between radio and TV a hundred years. And so so it, and it speeds up because it's an accelerator. It's constant. Well, we're biological creatures. We are not constant machines. We have to shut ourselves off, which is called sleep, at least for eight to nine hours a day in order to allow our whole systems to reset, to refuel. And so a biological system is programmed at its essence to have a push and to have a pause and to have a push, and to have a pause. Unlike the computer that pushes, 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 drives, 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 faster, 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 more, more, more. Oh my God, I'm going to engage, and then I'm going to engage my hands. I'm going to engage my mouth. I'm going to engage my eyes. I'm going to engage my hands. I'm going to engage me because, you know, our life now has become uh, this relationship that we have with technology. So we're riding on technology at a pace that is neurobiologically unhealthy and destructive, counter healthy to our own nervous systems. And, you know, we we're, we're just riding it. And, and, and at some point we need to wake up and recognize how much screen time, how late can I engage with a computer screen or a phone screen or, or some kind of a game screen and, 
expect my neurons to calm down enough so that I can move into a quality deep sleep, run through these cycles of light sleep to deep sleep to REM sleep, et cetera, throughout the night, How allow myself to have that and then not have to have an alarm clock that wakes me up at some you know specific time, which is arbitrary to my natural biorhythm. So, so how many of us are allowing ourselves to go to sleep at a reasonable hour as our brain says, you know, it's dark outside, circadian rhythm, it's time to calm down, st stop the stimulation and allow ourselves to wake up without an alarm clock so that our system is biologically prepared us it's, it, it has, it has weeded the garden, if you will, from life previous for the new day. I see that in my own life. Of course, how many of us can trace mistakes that we make in life to either I was moving too fast or I was tired. I hadn't had enough sleep. I wasn't clear in my thinking or I hadn't calmed down and reflected. All of those things that you just mentioned mitigate against deep reflection. Uh, the French philosopher Blaise Pascal said every problem in the world stems from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. We don't have the capacity to be alone. And I, you know, where I see such sadness about this, Jill, or feel such sadness about it, is with children. These young kids, they're not out in nature. They're not, they're not bred to have any sense of just kind of hang out by yourself, honey, rather than always having the, the social media on. I can't even imagine what all that screen time is doing to their little brains. You know, when I see these little children, little children before their brains have even fully formed and they're just stuck on these screens. And also, if, if these kids, uh, I was at a restaurant once. It was many years ago. It was in Houston. And there was a, a table of grown-ups next to me, and there was a little baby still so small that the child was in a high chair at the table. And this little one had a screen. And while all the adults were talking, this little baby was very happy with her, her screen. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is the age where her brain should be picking up clues right. and cues yeah. about social interaction right. and how people relate seeing people's faces, and instead she's being trained to think the action is on the screen and right. people are peripheral. Right. How will humanity have a chance if people think the action is on a screen and other human beings are peripheral? Exactly. There seems such an urgency to all this. There, 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 it's, it's a very interesting time because, um, that is exactly what we've done with the millennial population, millions upon millions of our children. Their very first relationship in their crib was a little computer bear, Teddy Ruskin. And so their original relationship was with technology as opposed to human. And, and as they learned, as the millennials learned, they learned through the right brain skill sets where boomers learned through the left brain skill sets. So for example, boomers, we learned that uh, two plus two is four, three times three is nine, six times six is 36. We learned automatic remote left brain multiple multiplication. The, the millennials learn two plus two by looking at two chickens plus two cows equals four animals. So they end Ended up with a visual learning, which is the right through their right brain skills. And so when we look at the differences between wow. us boomers and our children millennials, it's not just a typical generational gap. It is a brain separation. The millennials are much wow. more right brained by nature. So, but we've put them into the left brain world. And, um, uh, and now we, the boomers are trying to figure out, well, the millennials are ruling the world now. They're the young, they're the up and coming. And how do we fit ourselves and our consciousness is inside of their value structure because their value, they're so different than we are. So we want them to be like us, but in actuality, we're going to have to figure out how do we actually fit into their world and have value to them, or we're going to have a major collision. 
Wow, that's so interesting. Well, is it a major collision or is it just the natural cycle by which generations come and generations go? I mean, the well, next I, big phase I, of the boomers is I think the, even in the, the right, but I think in the past it was still a left brain versus left brain generational shift. In this mm-hmm. case, it's a yeah, left brain yeah. right brain. And and then even younger than well, the millennials are the generation Z. And and so they are even more right brained uh, because now they are moving into uh-huh. the right brain world of the millennials. So so we are in an evolution and and we have to find that meeting ground and that peaceful ground. And that's why whenever I can I come across really beautiful, brilliant millennials, I attract them like magnets because I need them in my world as an as a, a boomer. And and they need me, whether they know it or not. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, with some sense of of grounding and structure uh, of a different uh, uh, of a different kind of norm. So it, we really are reaching across that corpus callosum to find one another. And I think that that is actually yes. going to strengthen us as we become more whole brain. They need to become more like us, and we need to become more like them to evolve into what we all want. Absolutely. I mean, intergenerational uh, connection is sort of a buzz today. And for good reason. I think that no matter what, every age knows more than another. The older you are, the more you know certain things. The younger you are, the more you know certain other things. The younger you are, the more you know what's happening now. The yes. older you are, the more you know about things that never change, that just always spiral back. I, I remember reading, Jill, you and I might have even discussed this at some point. I remember reading an article. Um, a bunch of neuroscientists, brain researchers, et cetera, had come together. For all I know, you were there uh, at this conference, and they were talking about dementia. They were talking about Alzheimer's, and they were talking about memory loss as we age. And the the thesis that they were discussing was the idea that some kinds of memory loss are evolutionary, just as some are so obviously devolutionary. The theory was that the brain works like a computer and that at certain times when there is enough data within one, within one bucket, with one, within one filter, the brain simply drops the details because it doesn't need it anymore. It has the pattern. It understands the pattern. It doesn't need to remember the details anymore. So the way I remember this was in the New York Times. So the way the story was told, all these scientists got very excited talking about this, that there might be this evolutionary thing that happens as we age, that the brain might be functioning to a higher order, that what might look at first like less is actually more. So they were talking about it. And one of the scientists said, oh my God, we have to come up for name with a name for this. We, we need a name for this. And then there was silence at the table. Everybody clearly was thinking the same thing. And finally, somebody said, wisdom. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Does that sound right to you? Yes, it does. Absolutely. So it's almost like when we are first born, we are in a natural brain huddle. Mm -hmm. But as we get older, there's almost like, you know, sometimes when I think about we don't move as fast when we're older, right? But it seems to me the fact that I don't move as fast is somehow more appropriately aligned with the kind of thinking that is my highest functioning right now. Because the highest state of my being right now, and I know you feel this way too, with what you've told me about living in Kentucky and nature, Mm -hmm. somehow the highest calling for us at this point in our lives is not that we're running around. Mm-hmm. It's that we're sitting there thinking. You know, I remember mm-hmm. reading once a saying from a woman, Jill, in youth you learn, in age you understand. That's mm-hmm. kind of like what you're talking about with the two books of yours, you know, moving from stroke of insight to whole brain living. With um, uh, stroke of insight, I learned something. With mm-hmm. whole brain living, this is what I now understand. Right. So we actually right. understand more. Or yes. can if yes. the brain is able to huddle the way it needs to. Exactly. Tell me anything more that you understand about 
I mean, we all know the negative aspects of brain functioning as we get mm-hmm. older and dementia, et cetera. Mm-hmm. It seems to me, as a woman who myself is aging, there's something positive going on here too. I can't mm-hmm. put my finger on it. I'm not a, I, I'm not a scientist, mm-hmm. but once I get past the cosmetic aspects of getting older, uh, mm-hmm. right? There's something wonderful going on. Can you mm-hmm. tell me what's going on? I think it's freedom from the societal norm. You know, uh, as, as young women, uh, you know, we, we have to look a certain way. We have to speak a certain way. We have to dance a certain way in order to be an accepted part of the group side of ourselves that we want to be a part of or how we want to be viewed by males, how we want to be viewed academically or professionally. Um, and I think as, as we age, um, you know, uh, we gain a certain sense of freedom, uh, especially women in general who um, have had children and their focus was on being a mother and and rearing some healthy children when as that nest in- empties, then now we're looking at the spouse and saying, okay, well, what's our r- relationship going to be now? Because you, we're focusing on one another now. We make decisions about that relationship. And, um, but it, I think as women reach different decades, there's this, there's this shift that happens inside of us. When we're 40, our children are starting to leave the nest. Uh, by 50, they've pretty much left the nest. And now I'm looking at, I just spent half a century being of service to my family, but what, what am I doing here? What is my contribution? How do I, how do I bring, how do I find true meaning? in my life and how do I be of service to the bigger picture? And I think by the time we we reach 60, we're pretty much on our own as far as I really don't care what you people think about me anymore. I have my purpose and I need to bring my purpose and do my thing (laughs) regardless of all the other judgment. And by when I look at these beautiful women who are in their 70s and 80s who are truly living their lives on purpose, they radiate youth. They radiate their beauty. Their hearts are wide open. They're loving the world. And they they have found their perfection in being of service, not just to m- me and mine, my family, my spouse, my minimal, but to the bigger picture. How do I make my contribution and use my life to serve the bigger picture? So, so I think that there's definitely a journey that women in general, at least the Western woman that I'm familiar with, uh, that, that we have embarked upon. And, and I love this stage in my life. I'm 60 something now. And I love being 60 something because there's this incredible freedom to be who I am, to be what I believe is true and to make my, my statement and at the same time, balance that with self-nurturing and love and joy. And the healthier I am, the healthier I project into the world. And hopefully the more positive the impact of my life is on those around me, near and far. Well, nobody can doubt the impact you've had on the world. Nobody can doubt the impact of your first book, My Stroke of Insight. And I think that the second one, The Whole Brain Living, is such a profound extension. The lessons you've learned, what you've come to understand, and once again, you're taking the rest of us with you. As we age, as we move into the time of the cool crone of the wise grandmother, um, and it's correlative, of course, among men, Mm-hmm. Is it possible that the brain stays healthy, even grows healthier uh, uh, oh, to align I, with I us think, in this new yes. phase of freedom? I think absolutely. I think my brain is probably healthier now because I have taken total responsibility for it. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, it, I feed it well. I feed it sleep. I nurture it with good food. I nurture it with important connections and conversation. Uh, it's important to me to not just have it be inside of me, but to make my contribution externally. I have to have enough quiet 
in my my external in order for me to hear myself so for you know a common ritual of waking up in the morning and moving into prayer moving into meditation move into mantra move into yoga types of movement things that allow me to to say hello to my beautiful 50 trillion this is the bridge of my life from this consciousness wherever it is in the big picture to whatever it becomes in the in the macrocosm of humanity this is this is my garden how do i nurture this space so that it can be healthy and and i think that when we're truly in that healthy space of gratitude and appreciation and acceptance then then it doesn't matter how much of this life I get. What matters is what is the quality of the living I get to have while I am in this form in relationship with others. One last thing that I think that you uh, spoke to a little bit when you and I were speaking earlier, you were talking about the island where you spend time and you were talking about the blue herons there. It seems to me that part of the evolution, this next phase, has to do with a more enlightened perspective on other species. Ugh. And you were talking about younger people bringing this forth. We are becoming more sensitive to other species that inhabit this planet with us. And also, as you were saying, the nurturing that this gives us, mm -hmm. the violence that is done to animals, we're really beginning to appreciate what violence it is to ourselves. We're beginning to appreciate the greater intelligence, whether we're talking about whales or talking about dolphins. We're beginning to see things the way elephants treat their young, all of these kinds of things. I, I feel that that's part of this larger expansion of what it means to really be an integrated human being and certainly how that must affect your brain. I, I'm the way you were talking about it, living on an island, experiencing the herons you said. I think it is so important to remember that at a neuroanatomical level, at the level of the brain anatomy, we are feeling creatures who think. We are feeling creatures who think, Ugh. not thinking creatures who feel. And our heart oh, connection, wow. if our heart is not in peace, we're going to experience alarm, alarm, alert, alert, anxiety. And when you look at the astronomical epidemic of, of anxiety, not just because of the pandemic, we had this problem before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then you put a virus in that mix. And, yeah. and even those who were mm -hmm. relatively had good, relatively good coping skills have just reached out and maxed out on their coping skills. And then you're looking at reactivity and that emotional attacking in public that is going on in relationship to the complexity of emotions. So, so we are feeling creatures who think, and as we become sensitive to really recognizing that other, other mammals love and other mammals have families and other, other mammals are much more like us than they are different from us. We are feeling creatures who think, and that, that is automatically going to bring a charge to the difference, you know, I remember as a teenager, the world I was inheriting versus the idealized world I wanted. And it was night and day 40 years ago. And this is 40 years later. Uh, so this is just, this is so beyond. And I think even what you were just saying also relates to animals. I think a lot of the trend towards veganism vegetarianism, even leaning in, realizing that you were taking in the suffering of that animal. It's got to yep. affect your brain, it's got to yep. affect your feelings. You are ingesting that suffering. Yep. You know, Jill, when I listen to you, I just feel everything we need to be knowing, we're, we're beginning to know. People like yourself, the people speaking the deeper wisdom in every area that's needed today. It's happening. 
The only question is whether we get there fast enough. The only question is whether we are willing to embody what we know fast enough. I think the era of data collection is over. We, we have enough people like yourself. Here's the data. Now, what are we going to do with it? Now right. it's time for courage. Now it's time for the alchemy of the soul. Now it's That's time right. for application. Now it's time for embodiment. And I think every time someone such as yourself speaks it with the clarity, articulation, eloquence, and backing uh, an actual fact in science like you do, this diminishes the time. You know, it collapses time. It gives us more of an opportunity to get there and to get there in time. I, I think that, that we are finding our tribes of consciousness and that because of the internet, we have the ability to, to bring like-minded and like-heartedness together in a way that we haven't done that yet. And I think that that is the phase that we're currently in. We're finding one another. And I think that as we look at the societal norm of news is that left brain, horrible, rip me down, break my heart, horrible, the vicious, the horrible violence that we do to one another, much less to, you know, that we are exuding as an animal in pain, that there's a whole flock of us who are holding a light so bright. And I know that as I take my candle to your candle, I light your candle. It doesn't take my light away. It makes our light bigger. And so I think that really coming up with tools that we can to increase the visual nature of who's connecting, how are we connecting, how do we find our like-minded, build our tribe, and let that love grow so much stronger than the fear in the pain that hooks us into that violence, then, you know, at some point, there will be a global shift. So I'm with you. I'm hoping that that happens soon enough. I have faith. I have hope. I have love in my heart. And all I can do is show up by my best as one of those light carriers, as are you, and as are people who are listening. I mean, it's beautiful, the beauty within us that we are connecting. And... When we do move into that space that you have so eloquently described in both your books, we transcend time. So we yeah, don't have to worry do. that it's a late hour. Exactly. Because this stuff, this vertical ascension can happen if enough of us get there. Thank you so much, Jill. So once again, everybody, this book is called Whole Brain Living by Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor, PhD, The Anatomy of Choice and the Four Characters that Drive Our Life. This book is beyond worth reading. It's worth living. Thank you, Jill. All my love to you. Wonderful to see you again, to talk to you again, and I look forward to the next time. Thank you, Marianne.